Luke 13 is where we're going to be. And uh, I don't, you know, th- not all the time I showcase my shirt. Because many of you are like, what animal? What is on his shirt today? And I've gotten chickens and I've gotten shrimp and I've got, but this one is special. You want to know why? Because there's manatees on my shirt. Manatees. Someone heard me. Was it a cry? Was it a plea? Was it a prayer? If only I had a shirt with manatees on it. Well, lo and behold, someone said, are you home? This was yesterday. Are you home? I pull up. There's a gift wrap package they give to me. I open it, and it's a shirt with manatees on it. Best day ever? Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. But of all the animals, right, there's something about the sea cow. Not just my nickname in high school, but I love the manatee. Someone had heard with specificity that Scott wants a shirt with manatees, and they went and they sought it out and they found it. Now, I'm sure if there was a gift wrap package and I open it and there was, a, there was a shirt with snails on it, I would have been excited. I would have been elated. But no, with all the, the cornucopia of, of shirts out there with animals on it, someone got me this. Now, someone would be like, you know, Scott, aren't you being a little narrow-minded? Aren't, aren't you being a little bit too, too focused and myopic? I mean, I've got shirts with lions and kung fu pandas, and, but there's this shirt. Would you call me narrow-minded because I wanted a shirt ma- with manatees? No, because here's what we celebrate. We celebrate the fact that we live in a society where there's choices. Right? You go to a restaurant today, right? And you get to look at this, this plethora of stuff on the menu. Right? And say you ordered something. Let's say you ordered steak fajitas. Don't, don't they, they sound pretty good, right? And all of a sudden, the server comes out and gives you a bean burrito. No sauce. No sauce. What, what would you say to that, that server? You'd be like, uh, excuse me, on contraire, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I ordered that. What if the server said, well, you're just being narrow-minded. You're, you're having a bean burrito today. We would be all up in arms, wouldn't we? How dare you think that life is, is all about these choices? And we would, we would fight against that, right? But there are some things. There are some things in this world where uh, a a narrowness is absolutely essential. There's no flexibility. You get on a plane, and you're destined for Hawaii, and all of a sudden the pilot comes on and says, guys, guess what? We're bypassing the computer. We're just going to see where the wind takes us. You'd be like, "Uh, I want to off this plane. Right? Right? You, you get on because you don't want there to be choices. You, you've signed up to go to a very specific place. There are situations in life that require things to be done in a certain way. Entering a foreign country. If you've traveled extensively, you know the hoops you have to jump through. I remember going to North Africa and feeling like, these guys are going to, I'm going to become a statistic of all the things, very narrow, but they had the right and the authority to do that. What about vaccinations? What if they're like, you know what, they say one, we're going to give you five vials. You'd be like, no, no, no. There needs to be a narrowness. There needs to be an exactness to this. None of us would consider any agency issuing specific requirements narrow-minded. We acknowledge readily their right and even their necessity to set requirements. And yet, when it comes to spirituality, we allow a lot of, lot of wiggle room. Perhaps too much. Perhaps when it comes to the most important part of who we are as, as human beings, why do we deny God the same privilege of saying, I want this? and not this. I want you to be narrow 
in your thinking. I want you to be narrow in your approach. See, many of us think we can go ahead and just set our terms with God as far as spirituality is concerned, and God would actually say just the exact opposite. I mean, you get a manufacturer who says, you put this type of fuel in your car. Well, guess what? You put lemonade in there, you're going to ruin your car. There's a, there's a design that the manufacturer says, this is how you best operate. We would not call the manufacturer narrow-minded, would we? Well, neither should we with God. See, there's a, there's a narrowness that we need to talk about when it comes to a life of faith. And sometimes there's a narrowness that's bad, and sometimes there's a narrowness that's good. And we get to talk about that this morning when it comes to the, 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 the teachings of, of Jesus. So Luke chapter 13, we're going to actually finish this chapter, and I know some of you are thinking, wow, we flew through chapter 13, and this is kind of how Luke accelerates right now. It's like we're going to start really picking up some steam here. But Jesus is confronted with an interesting question, and classic Jesus doesn't answer the question but he answers it in a, in a much more significant way. And I think this is important for us to talk about today. Luke 13, starting in verse 22. So Jesus is passing through from one city and village to another, teaching, proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, answering, Lord, open to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and we drank in your presence, and you taught us in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you who are evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth where there when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom, but yourselves being cast out. And they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. Just at that time, some of the Pharisees came up and said, Jesus, go away and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. He says to them, go and tell that fox, not but another meaning. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow on the third day and I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent who you sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your, your children together just as a hen gather her, gathers her chicks under her wings and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. So, this idea of narrowness. There's a narrowness that's bad, there's a narrowness that's good. Let's, let's look at this, this topic as we look at the first point, and it's this, there's a narrow perspective. And, and this is, in a bad context where someone in the crowd cries out to Jesus unnamed. We don't know who this person is. But he seems to assume something about himself and probably the rest of the the Jewish people that that are listening. So the man asks this question and then Jesus addresses the crowd. Now, here's what's really cool. Verse 22, it says, so he's passing through one city and village to another. Jesus always had time to just stop and talk to people and teach people. Here he is on his way to Jerusalem, and here's what's really cool about Jesus. He always had room for the little guy. And it's almost like the villages and the cities are all passed up. You know, when, you know, back in the day of concerts, oh, you guys remember those days? Man, they always pass by certain cities. You're like, why don't they tour here? Well, Jesus, the tour hits all the little places. Bisbee, Sierra Vista, Tuba City. Jesus is hitting them all. Right? And he's stopping and he's engaging. And this, on his way to the cross, he still shows care and compassion. And so here he is and this guy says, Hey, Jesus, 
are there just a few who are being saved? Now you're thinking to yourself, why is this such a bad question? Well, you're going to see why, because this man has a narrow perspective. He is a Jew. And he asked the question predicated upon, hey, we as the Jews, we're good. <laughs> we're in. We've got it. What about other people? Because here's what the Jews thought. We're guaranteed eternal life. But what about some of the worst Gentiles? What about all those people that are not like us? So there's this sense of, a, there's a smugness. There's this sense of a, a self-complacency that assumes he and they are in, and he's wondering who else is in too, Jesus. This man had probably never entertained the thought that he was ever out. Right? This man was already on the inside. He's a Jew. But the Gentiles, well, what do you think, Jesus? How many of them are going to get in? And in his mind, he said, because they have a lot of hoops to jump through in order to be in. So how shocking Jesus' words must have been to those. <laughs> He's going to take their whole belief system and turn it upside down. Have you ever had your world turned upside down by Jesus? Because guess what? It's going to happen again. Because there's this, again, there's, there's a smugness, there's a self-complacency that we also have embraced where, where we think we're good. And I, wa I want to just let you know, out of all love, I'm going to say that some of you, you're not good. You're not in like you think you're in. <laughs> and I'm only saying this because I love you. We have to ask yourself, what makes you think you're in? What makes you think like, you know, you know, maybe you go to bed at night going, God, aren't you glad I'm on your side? <laughs> but my neighbor, that's another story. You know that neighbor? Yeah, we all got him, right? Here's where Jesus then says, let's, let's turn your world upside down. Point number two. There's this narrow passage. So the hearers expected Jesus to affirm that all the Jews are going to make it through the pearly gates. Like, they're just looking for, like, give us a word of encouragement and affirmation and, and remind us that we're good, Jesus. And Jesus' reply is surprising because it's not access that may be limited, but who actually gains entry that Jesus wants to talk about. Look at verse 24. Strive to enter by the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, here's the crazy thing. Many are not in. And many will not be in. Jesus is saying to all of us, I'm ready to assault your complacency. I'm ready to attack your privilege and your presumption. And I want you to really stop and, and look at your heart. And he's not afraid to do this. Paul does the same thing in Romans chapter 2. Verses 17 through 21. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and prove what is excellent because you are instructed from the law and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of the knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against, do you steal? See, Paul's concern is that these guys believe in God and they're in, in name only, but not in spirit. Paul's concern is, that, like there's this, there's this knowledge, but there's not this relationship. And so Jesus is not afraid to, to turn a theoretical conversation into a very practical conversation. Here's what we're not into. We're not into hanging out in our holy huddles 
and talking theology if it doesn't translate into practical living. Can I get an amen for somebody? Let me just tell you, church, I love you guys, but you don't need another Christian bestseller to read. You don't need another conference to go to. You don't need another seminar. To, what you need to stop doing is chasing the theoretical and start applying to what's practical. Jesus is not going to get into a theoretical debate. He is not going to get into argument. He's not going to get into to speculation, right? He is saying to this man and everyone listening that the truth of God and God's word is not given to us so we can speculate about abstract things, but the truth of God is given to us so that we can change our lives and impact the world we live in for his glory and our good. See, what's practical right now is, is taking this topic to a very personal level. Here's what I don't care about. Like, if you go out for steak fajitas today, and I've got no stock in steak fajitas. There's not a reason why I'm mentioning steak fajitas. But if you sit around and be like, well, boy, the Greek and the Hebrew and the way Scott, you know, exposited the, the theology and the doctrine, you all sit around and talk about that. I sit there and go, that's fine, but it's not important. What's important is when you sit around and you start talking about, this is how this is going to change my life today. And this is how it's going to impact my walk tomorrow. And this is how I'm going to love my wife and love my neighbor and, and pray for my coworker. When they, it starts having that personal practical effect, then we're sitting there going, yes! But, but we don't need more theory. See, he says, the qu question is not how many Here's what Jesus says. The question is, are you? Isn't this awesome? Like Jesus, his questioner had asked, will the saved be few? And Jesus says, will the saved be you? Boy, and I've sat in conversations where we've talked about this. And I've thought to myself, God knows. God's in control. Let me not be distracted by the number and let me be consumed by making sure I'm in and everybody else I know is in. Matthew chapter 7. See, what Luke is, is talking about here is, is similar to what Jesus taught elsewhere. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction, but, and those who enter it are many, but the gate that is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. See, we don't know how many, but we do know that there are going to be many who are going to lead to destruction. I'm not concerned about the number. I'm concerned about my, my, my calling to make sure that I'm in and to find out if everybody else is in. So there's three things we need to talk about. Number one, there's the demand for individuality. And why is this important? Because this man had asked Jesus a question because he was part of a group. Kind of like us, right? Oh, surely the United States of America, we're in. Because anyone who's born here is a Christian. We're a Christian country. No, we're not. God doesn't save countries. But, but, but God, I'm, I was part of Missio Day Church. Well, sorry, God doesn't save churches either. God doesn't save clubs and organizations. God saves individuals. Whether they're from the United States or Somalia. Whether they're part of the Missio Day Coffee Club or the Dungeons and Dragons Club. Right? He saves individuals. It is easy to have this herd mentality. Like doggone it, I was born with God bless America on my birth certificate, so therefore I'm in. Guess where that accent's from? Don't, don't. I'm the worst with accents. <laughs> Here's the thing. God doesn't save nations. God saves individuals. And I feel sorry for a culture that has created this, well, we're because we're part of this political entity and this affinity group, therefore I'm in. No, you're not. If you know Jesus as an individual, 
each person must pass through the door. Because there's a reason why it's narrow. You don't go in as a team. (laughs) You're like, I'm barely getting through myself. That's the idea. God doesn't want you to be concerned about everybody else. He wants you to be certain about yourself. Why do you think you're in? Because you're an American? Because you're part of this organization? Your family? Certainly God doesn't save you because of your, your, your heritage. Right? This is not hereditary. This is spiritual. See, Jesus is urging all of us who have so many religious privileges and and advantages with all tenderness and with all urgency, he's pressing us on the issue of individual repentance. Has your heart been broken? Have you been brought to nothing? Have you had all sense of self-achievement stripped away? I'm not concerned about everybody else. Primarily, I'm concerned about myself. And with that comes the next, the demand for humility. When you realize that Christianity ultimately is not a team sport, it's an individual realization and certainty that God knows you by name and wants to save you individually, it requires humility that there's nothing you bring to the table. This man has come from a heritage, a lineage, a culture, a community where everyone thought, we're in because we adhere by these laws and these rules and these regulations. And Jesus says, you realize that until you come to me broken and poor and empty, you can't have God. Blessed are the poor in spirit where there's an abject poverty that sets into your heart that says there's nothing to, nothing within me that I can bring to even save myself. See, there's a demand here for humility that nothing you can bring to salvation. It's all of God. Talk about humbling because we're, we're masters in trying to make sure our, our dossier, our resume, everything looks good. Like, God, look at my achievements and look at my successes and look at all the stuff I've done. I even went to church twice this week. God says, I I don't want attendance. I I don't want mealtime prayers. I don't want offerings. Those things are good. But what's ultimate is if God gets all that stuff from you and he doesn't have your heart, you're, you're ruined. Larry King passed away a couple days ago. Fascinating guy. Fascinating guy. Been on radio and television since 57. Interviewing thousands of guests over the decades. Married eight times to seven women. Figure that out. Calls himself an agnostic atheist. Which, as smart as Larry is, you can't have both. Atheist, there is no God. Agnostic, yeah, there might be. I call agnostics cowardly atheists. Right? Just make a decision. Now, within agnosticism, there's soft agnosticism and hard agnosticism. Hard agnosticism says, we absolutely cannot know there is a God. There might be, but we absolutely cannot know. Soft agnosticism says, we might be able to know. But Larry's straddling the lines, right? I'm, a, I'm an agnostic atheist. Someone once pressed him in, a, in an interview where he became the interviewee. Larry, if you could select any one person across all of history to interview, who would it be? Larry King's answer was this. I would like to interview Jesus Christ. And so the interviewer asked, And what would you like to ask him? King replied, I would like to ask him if he was indeed virgin born. He says, because the answer to that question would define history for me. And 
when King knew that this would probably get out, he said, make sure you follow up my statement with this, I'm not being facetious. See, even King, as an agnostic atheist, realizes something about the person and work of Jesus Christ. That if Christ was who he said he was and did what he said he was going to do, then this is the most important question. Right? This is the most important question. Who is Jesus to you? Because when you reconsider the cataclysmic nature of the claims of Jesus Christ, it humbles you. That God of very gods left his throne in heaven to come into our messy world to love people like us unconditionally, knowing that we had nothing to offer, nothing to bring to the table, and yet he gives us eternal life for all those who believe. Are you kidding me? Who writes stories like this? But for 87 years, King wrestled with this. And who knows if he's still wrestling with it today. But the question is not what did Larry King believe. <laughs> it's back to you. Have you reconsidered the, the claims of Christ? Are you ready to humble yourself? And realize that Jesus says, come to me, you who are naked and poor, who have nothing, and believe in me so that you may be saved. Because here's the last point is this. There's the, the last point in this section, not the message. There's the demand for what? Determination. This kind of information is not the kind of information you say, ah, I'll, salvation, I'll take care of it tomorrow. Eternal life, yeah, maybe Wednesday. I think I got a block in the afternoon open. No, 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 no. Jesus says, strive, verse 24. Strive, literally the word is agonize. There's one thing I know to be true when it comes to faith. Many of us don't agonize when it comes to faith. Right? It's, it's, it's this idea of I'm going to give it to my best in a con to win a contest. It's this intense struggle. It's exactly like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. And I love Paul's imagery and how he draws upon uh, sports. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, and they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we are doing this to re receive an imperishable one. See, he's saying that I want to fight, I want to strive as if my life depends on it, not that you're saved by your effort, but you are not saved without your effort. Rewind, I heard someone say it. Rewind. Christ is not preaching a works-based salvation. What he is saying is that when you come to know God, and the richness of eternal life that he promises you now and forever, you work like crazy to know him more and to grow in him more. If there's no agonizing in your Christian journey, there is no Christian journey. Right? We don't strive and are not saved by effort, but we are not saved without effort. As if I've, I've clocked in with Jesus, I'm good, and I can just throw my life on cruise control for the rest of the way. No, 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 no. Philippians chapter 2, not on the screen, bonus verse, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Meaning now there is a cooperative work in which if you have eternal life, it's not that you have to do it, it's that you want to do it. Right? Are you agonizing over your soul? Are you agonizing over your heart? Are you agonizing to desire to honor God more than you want to honor anything else in your life? This is the kind of demand that Jesus puts on us. And it is difficult, but it's not impossible. And I know some of you are sitting there going, I don't want to sign up for that. But here's the problem. You've signed up for some other program and it's not doing any good for you. 
I mean, look at John chapter 6. Jesus says this, verse 27 through 29. Do not work for the food that perishes. Do not run the race for the prize that's perishable. What's, what's the word? Perish. You are living your lives and agonos over, over things that will not last for eternity. But, but work for the food that endures. That word work, strive. Give it your all which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set what his seal. And then they said to him, what must we do? Right, they're thinking, okay, Jesus, just give us a set of instructions and we'll do it. And what does he do? He comes back to belief. You see how the two can coexist together? We believe and there's nothing else attached, right? We don't bring any good works to the table. But while we are not saved by good works, there's a genuine salvation that will result in good works. You like that? I I did a little Dr. Seuss on you there. (laughs) Salvation requires concentrated effort. Not just in knowing God, but growing in Christ. Right? It's, it's, It's the athlete when will, are they scheduling the Olympics this year? I hope so. The Olympics are so much fun, right? Winter, summer, we can debate all about that. But here's the thing. Those athletes right now that are preparing for the Olympics, I guarantee you right now they're not eating Twinkies and Ding Dongs. There is a concentrated effort that they want to win. Someone who wants to win. You watch the documentary, The Last Dance, about Michael Jordan. I'm sitting there going, if only we as followers of Christ had that l- focus, that concentration, that, 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 that energy to fight for that which is eternal. Third point. So then he says, okay, let's, let's, here's my statement. Strive. Make sure you enter that narrow door. But then there's this, again, this undercurrent of an attitude that Jesus needs to unpack. So he shocks the listeners, right, by, by, by saying to them, hey, not only are you not in the house, but you're not even in at the kingdom table to his hearers, right? This is, this is mind-blowing, right? This is like going to a church and being like, hey, guys, guess what? You have crosses, you have stained glass, you have Bibles, but I'm going to tell you guys, you don't know Jesus. And we're like, What? But but listen to what Jesus is saying. There is an importance of urgency here. Why do you believe what you believe? Well, because my parents went here, and this is the family Bible, and my my grandpappy was a preacher, and I was born in America. All that stuff, right? America. Here's the thing. There's an urgency. Look what he says. Verse 25. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, you are going to be outside and you're going to be knocking saying, "Uh, uh, did you forget about us? We're out here. Notice who's in control. The master. The master knows. And there's this importance of urgency that says the door will eventually close. It's not the narrowness of the door which is going to pose a problem to to Israel or to Gentiles, but it's the closedness of the door. It matters not how wide the door is. What matters is when will it close. The house is on fire. The boat is sinking, and there's people that need to be rescued, and what are you doing? Boy, I felt this urgency this week. There's been a guy I've been sharing the gospel with who's had recently some major health complications, he would even tell you he may not even have weeks. And he says, can we talk tomorrow? I'm like, darn right, we're going to talk tomorrow. Right there, on that seat where Carrie is, gospel moment, right? Dude, you are not guaranteed tomorrow. God wants you to believe. I want you to believe. I want you to be saved. And, and, the, and the conversations past had no sense of the urgency that it did this past week. But why not? 
Because here's a person where literally he didn't think he was going to make it through the holidays. And I'm like, shouldn't that spark some sort of urgency within you? Right? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 7 and 11, right? Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. There are always consequences when you delay. Don't forget that. Today. When's a good time? Today. (laughs) If you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Let us therefore strive. Interesting. Strive to enter the rest so that no one may be may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Then in, chapter, and then in verse 11, he says this. So today, David, long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his hearts, don't harden your hearts. Verse 11, let's skip forward. We're good? Cool. I like it. All right, we'll stop there. Hold on. You're looking at it? We got it? We're, what's, what's happening? You got it? No, I don't. Okay, here we go. Nope, don't want it. Go for it. <laughs> we read it, yeah. That's right. So there, we'll stop right there. You like how we're, we're intuitively connected with each other? 29 years next month. Woo! Only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. There's an urgency that, that Paul even talks about. And I was thinking about this verse when I was talking to my friend, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Look at this. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Think about that word, persuade. You know what this tells us? That you're not responsible for anyone's change of heart. But you can be an instrument of God in their life. I don't know where my friend's going to end up for eternity. But you better believe, excuse the expression, I'm going to fight like hell for his soul. Right? Today's the day. And if you don't act today, there may not be tomorrow. I was thinking about growing up, so back to concerts. Oh. You don't know how many, because I love music. I love music. You don't know how many people over the years. I'm on speed dial, number one. I've got an extra concert ticket. And if you get down to this location in the next 30 minutes, you're in. I remember you two on the Innocence Experience Tour. I'm like, I'm not chilling out 100. I love you two. I've seen them like eight times, right? This guy called me. You, You have 30 minutes. Get down here and get the ticket. And you better believe, I canceled lunches. I canceled appointments. I, I maybe even skipped coffee. I know. But the importance of that event made me turn over my day upside down, and I beelined it to a destination where I had a certain amount of time to get there. Why? Because I loved the music, and I wanted that ticket, and I fought hard to get it. But there was a narrow window to make it happen. How much harder are we fighting for our hearts? Today is the day. The time is now. But here's the key, and this is what Jesus always brings back to, relationship, the importance of relationship. Right? Notice the owner I don't know where you're from. I, I don't know your name. But we, we, were, we were hanging out with you. We're, drink, we're drinking you know, Sonic slushies and eating cheeseburgers. And, 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 and the master's like, I don't, I don't know who you are. Again, because it's not hereditary. A relationship with God comes by faith through grace, right? By grace through faith. Association with Jesus is not identification with Jesus. Right? Exposure to Jesus is not knowledge of Jesus. 
See, ladies and gentlemen, identification means you know Christ in his crucifixion and in his burial and his resurrection. Romans chapter 6. Have you been crucified in him? Identified. Have you been buried with him? Identified. Have you been risen again in him? Identified. See, a responsive heart to Jesus is what God seeks, not a prideful one who is entitled, who says, well, because I'm this and this and this, I'm in. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Notice it doesn't say whoever goes to church has life. Who is ever part of this really super spiritual Christian club has life. Whoever has the Son, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Narrow? Yes. John chapter 14, verse 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. Narrow. Sounds pretty narrow, doesn't it? Well, the party... Next point, the narrow party. Check this out. I love this. As if he hasn't assaulted their complacency, he is just going to he's going to insult them even further. This is not this is not to say that you have the spiritual gift of insulting people and you can go out and do, Jesus has the right to do this. But notice who's sitting at the table, verse twenty eight. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because there are going to be people who see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves are being cast out. And they will come from the east and the west and the north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And those who thought they were first will be last and those who will be last will be first. Here's what Jesus is saying. Not everyone is going to be at the party that God's going to throw for eternity. And you need to understand that there's going to be some surprise guests at the table. And this means that all the nations of the world, this is why the east, west, north, south, it's so important it's because this is not exclusive to the Jews only. As, as Luke has already told us, the name of this whole series is called Jesus is for Everyone. And they're going to be out weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be sorrow and rage combined. Because they're going to say, we had a reservation at that table. We were on the guest list. And Jesus says, I never knew you. And they're going to look at the table and they're going to see Gentiles in the seat they thought they deserved. And there's Abraham, and there's Isaac and Jacob, and there's the prophets. Elijah passed the mashed potatoes, right? Like that. And then there's people from all over. But they're not in. Believe it or not, I... Seventh grade, one of my friends was throwing a party, and I thought for sure I was going to be there. Guess who didn't get an invitation? This guy. You want to know what I did? I rode my bike around on the street around his house, because I thought for sure, like, you forgot me. See, I thought I was in with my friend. But obviously, I didn't make the guest list. I thought maybe someone would look out the window and see Scott Morgan riding his bike around and be like, hey, Scott, come on in. There's something that happens when you just... You seem so self-certain, so self-assured, so confident. And when you don't make the list, see, I thought we were more friends than you thought we were. So you know what I did? I egged his house later. No, just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. Maybe I did. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Here's what I want you to know is that Jesus wants you at the party. And don't you dare look at yourself and be like, but I'm not perfect and I don't have my act together and my marriage is a wreck and my kids are disobedient and I'm horrible at work. And did Jesus put any of those little 
comments there and say, hey, the party's only for those people who have it all together. Let me just say right now, if the party was for those who had it all together, no one would be at the party. Jesus is for everyone. And doggone it, he wants you at that table. But he's not going to give you a place at the table unless you first have a relationship with him. Because it's not having a place at the table that's important. It's not even the food of eternity that's important. It's knowing that you've been loved like you've never been loved before. And forgiven in a way that you never thought possible. That's why God wants you there. And I'll close with this, and you can read the rest of the verses, but Jesus secures your place because he himself embraced a narrow path. And that narrow path included two things. A boldness when he was rejected himself and a brokenness when rejected by people. Think of what Christ endured for us, and this is what we've been celebrating through song and through prayers, the fact that Christ was bold. They tell him, hey, don't go to Jerusalem. Herod's there. And Christ said, I must enter into difficult situations that will destroy me. And he was bold to set that course because Herod to him was just a fox, which meant he's not a lion. Herod thinks, Herod thinks he's a lion. Jesus says he's a fox. Skittish, conniving, but ultimately, Jesus would go through this kangaroo, kangaroo court system, six trials between Romans and, and Jews and Herod and Pilate. But there was a boldness because he came to accomplish the will of his Father for you and me. And in that boldness, though, there's a brokenness because he weeps over the city that has a history of killing the prophets. Imagine this, entering a world you created and being hated by your creation. And yet he chooses to forgive. Oh, Jerusalem, if you would only understand that I wanted to love you like a hen gathers her chicks. Loving care. But I am bringing the message and you want to kill and crucify the messenger. Ladies and gentlemen, the mission of Christ is a mission for our hearts. We praise God for the work of Jesus. Because without the work of Jesus, we are lost and dead in our trespasses and sins. But if you choose to believe, God will make us alive in Christ and love us and secure us forever. All I know is by the grace of God, I got a seat at the table. I'm not going to be riding my bike around the, the gates of the pearly gates, right? And be like... What's going on in there? Are you in? Are you in? Have you believed? Have you trusted him who has stood in your place and become your substitute because doggone it, we have nothing to offer. And yet he gives us his life. Hallelujah, what a savior. God is good, is he not? All the time. Love you, church. So good to be with you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you are amazing. That once again, we have another Sunday morning to be together and, and to sing songs. And I, and I pray that the words that we've been able to sing haven't been disconnected from our hearts. I think about that song, All I Have is Christ. Lord, it's so true. And had you not loved us, we would still be rebels against you. Lord, thank you that once again, this, is, this, this time together, this, this, is like a, this is like an appetizer to the big party that's coming. We get to see each other and we get to smile and we get to cry and we get to hug each other and we get to be together and, and it's only because of Christ. That narrow door the gate that many of us have, have walked through. Lord, there's still some people here that are struggling. Let them know today that all who come to you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna show them that the, that, that the burden is light because you're, you're orchestrating this, that 
that we no longer have to be burdened and, and weighed down by our sin and our guilt and our shame, but with you there's forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for another day. This is just not Sunday. This is the day when we can celebrate. We have been invited to the party. And Jesus loves me. Lord, thank you for your, the grace and thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your patience. My prayer is for those that know you. Continue to show us what it means to strive. To, to just intensely struggle in a good way to know you and grow in you. And let us find people along the way that we can share the good news with. Because today is the day. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. Volunt